In a quiet Norwegian lake, a mysterious serpent swims, the pride of local residents. The boat was just lifted up. Then we were scared. It's known as Selma, the monster of Seljord. She uh, suddenly saw the, the thing. We could see waves being produced pretty violently. So nobody really knows anything about what's down there. Quite scary, I guess. <laughs> Norway's Seljord is a peaceful village of 3,000 people resting on the banks of Seljord Lake. Here, 200 kilometers or 125 miles from the nation's capital of Oslo, nature reigns supreme. The Seljord Lake is the jewel of the region. It's 16 square kilometers or six square miles kept pristine by local residents. And they take pride in the presence of a creature that arouses much debate, Selma a lake monster by turns amusing and terrifying. This is the case for Stig Ellingsen. While testing a new boat on behalf of the Red Cross, the former military man had the scare of his life. The Red Cross has just bought a new boat, like a diving boat. The, the motor was new, so we should drive very slow and uh, take only the tour. And we was in the middle uh, of the lake when it's deepest. It's like we slipped up and, uh, and then it's going like this. And we heard the motor was up in the, uh, in the air, and then it fell down again. And uh, we think that it was a um, uh, timber. Started up the boat again and drive about three meters, and then the boat was just lifted up. Approximately about this up from the lake. We were three people on this boat. It's about 200 kilos with the motor. So it was very heavy. Then we were scared. Just started up the motor and drive into the land as fast as possible. We felt that it was something in the lake who is living and uh, have uh, lots of power. Jan Svartal, the mayor of this small town, is particularly pleased to have so polarizing a creature living in Seljord Lake. Seljord is a small place, a small municipality, uh, but we have uh, 700 square kilometers. So uh, we have uh, a bit space around us. We drive around uh, the lake uh, uh, when we are going out of Seljord and we look out to see if we can see the sea serpent. People have seen it for also for hundreds of years. Two, three hundred years ago, we have stories about this uh, phenomenon. We take a bit advantage of it because it puts Seljord on the map, but uh, we don't have the tourist machine like uh, in uh, Loch Ness. One of the region's biggest draws to outsiders is a summer camp suit on the lake. Its manager, who is also a part-time teacher, has a passion for the monster. Although she's never seen the creature, she hopes with all her heart to meet him one day. My grandfather owned the, the farm, uh, which uh, now is the camping. Uh, my parents, uh, they started uh, to make the camping ground about um, in the middle of 80s. My husband and I started running it uh, in 2006. I think we are really lucky to have the legend or the sea monster. We are sitting here all every morning in the eating breakfast and we are looking out and see if there is something. So I really hope that I will one time see the large thing coming up. Uh, it's not necessary for me to see the hole with all the bumps, but I can see one large one and then I, yes. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, I'm sad about it, but I haven't seen it. Even if I have the view and I really look for it, um, I always uh, have the uh, explanation of what I see. I have met lots of people who see, uh, who uh, t have told me that I've seen it. I've heard people um, just wearing on the beach, or maybe they're sitting in their caravans and watching out, and then they see something. Uh, one of my students, she uh, was at the tower, and she caught it on movie 
uh, something strange, uh, really long. Um, she really believes that she has uh, caught a sea, sea serpent. They were um, watching out, uh, looking, of course, for the sea serpent. Uh, I guess all people visiting the tower are doing exactly that. And um, then she uh, suddenly saw the the thing, and she caught it on. She caught it on movie, and um, they showed it to me. And uh, I think it was really interesting. Too many people, which I trust, and I think they are. It's not drunk people from the pub. It's it's just uh, normal people uh, on vacation or driving or they see they say that they have seen something and I trust that they have seen something. The one in charge of Sellyard's future was luckier than Salfred. I have seen something, yes. Uh, I have seen these um, it may may look like waves. They are uh, moving like a whale up and down and uh, I saw like buckles on, on the sea so and then the one in front disappeared and a new one came up behind and then you know when the head goes down the first one will disappear and the buckle will move backwards until it disappears behind you know, it has a special way of sw swimming. Where did they come from? According to the uh, observations, the only explanation is that it is a serpent, a sea serpent. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Download Veely now. Over the centuries, there have been about 500 witnesses claiming to have seen the monster of Lake Selyard. For her part, Salfred Bjorg watches the lake carefully every day in search of clues that could lead to the monster. The home of the legend. The serpent, Sjöormen, that's the name, Sjöormen, that's what we call it. I'm looking for um, uh, cha changings in the water because um, I, now today it was really flat, so it's easy to see if something's changing. I'm looking for different kind of colors, I'm looking for especially waves. I'm looking for, it can be really flat, really quiet, and then something can suddenly comes up. The owner of this camping caravan, and they were sitting here, uh, Per, and the neighbor over there, uh, he, was see, he saw something white uh, swimming underwater, and then up again, and then straight ahead. Peter Fjagesund, professor of literature at the University of Telemark, is interested in the folklore surrounding this monster. According to him, the way the monster is said to swim contributes to its mystery. It's just called the Seljord Serpent, usually. Um, I think the most common uh, portrait is really uh, like a big log, like a big sort of the length of a proper tree. You know, but and and also with vertical movements, the classical sea serpent movement, um, which is of course rather peculiar because these vertical movements belong to mammals and birds, whereas reptiles and fish move horizontally. So it suggests that it's not a reptile or a fish. The monster's description varies in small ways depending on the witness, but everyone agrees it has the body of a serpent of about 15 to 25 meters or 50 to 80 feet in length. 
Its head is a cross between a snake and a horse. And then it's usually dark or black or brown, something like that, and a sort of thin neck. I met uh, people that uh, claim to have seen it, uh, yes, something big, then up to 50 meters, some, some claim. <laughs> so uh, there must be quite a view for those who have seen it. And very many people claim to have seen it. Not many say that they have seen the sea serpent, but they have seen something in the lake that uh, is mystical. Some people claim to have seen, uh, seen the head as well, with big black eyes and uh, looking like an elk, a moose, or uh, a cow, or something like, uh, like that, with the big, uh, big black uh, eyes. So, um, quite scary, I guess. <laughs> it was scary when you grow up uh, hearing about it. I haven't been looking for it, uh, but... Um, I have uh, I've written about people that uh, claim to have uh, seen it, so uh, I've seen their uh, photos. If they have uh, photos, we we look at it and uh, print it in the paper, and then it's up to the readers to decide if it's the sea serpent and or or what it is. There must be something since so many trustworthy people claim to have seen it. But in 2011, one particular sighting galvanized public opinion. We had one story and at, the, at the front page four years ago, two people uh, in, a, in a shop there uh, flying over, over the lake. It was worth letting them tell their stories. This is the article of the people in the helicopter that uh, claimed that this was the sea serpent. And they claimed it uh, changed direction when uh, the helicopter flew above it. So they described it as something big that moved a lot of uh, water. It was something they hadn't seen during their uh, 20 years working from the air. I hope there is a sea serpent, but um, I don't know. I uh, look out uh, of the windows and, and sometimes down on the beach, and there is a my tower down on the beach there I can see. I think it's really long and big and I think it's blue or green or gray and it has um, a big mouth with big teeth. I have seen something twice, which is rather peculiar. It was with um, an American friend, actually. Uh, we were driving along the lake. This was in 1982. The lake was totally calm. And we um, drove along there and came out of a bend and suddenly saw something swimming about, say, 50 yards from the road, from the shore. And we stopped the car, I walked outside, and there were two big eels swimming side by side in horizontal S's. We thought we could see a sort of fin at the back of both of them. Um, and then they just slowly disappeared. We agreed they would be four to five meters long something like that, definitely a lot bigger than an ordinary eel, which shouldn't be more than a metre and fifty at the very most. And we couldn't really see what it was, but we could see something was happening right there.
In Selyard, it's worth your while to visit the Sea Serpent Tower. Standing 17 meters or 55 feet high, it offers an ideal vantage to keep a lookout for the monster. But for the mayor, Selyard is much more than its lake monster. It is also a city rich in history and in perfect harmony with its natural surroundings. I'd like to show you Selyord. Selyord is a small uh, town or village. We have uh, 3,000 people and most of them live here in the center. We don't have much room down in the valley. Most of our air area is uh, up in the hills. I like to look up on the mountains and I like to look down from the mountains. To look on the center here and to look out on the lake. Seljur is uh, a small place, but it's central. It's central between the, the east and the west of Norway. And many people come to visit Seljur because of the, um, the fair that we have in autumn and the festivals in, su in summer. Now behind me, there you can see a classical Norwegian architecture. It's uh, from uh, 1300 and something. So it's very old. It was uh, built to keep um, food because there were no refrigerators or anything. So they had to, to keep the food cool. And then you have these thick walls of logs who made it a bit cool inside. And you can see it is, is put on uh, in top of the rocks so the mice would not get inside. So it's, it's very valuable. We have to take very good care of it. The Selyard monster legend dates back several centuries as well. In Norway, a country with a strong maritime tradition, sea monster legends are a part of their folklore. All we know is that the, the first um, reports about its possible existence go back to about 1750. So before then, we haven't really got any 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 eyewitness reports or anything, but that's the first story. And that's actually a, a story about um, a man who was rowing two boats across the lake, very close to where I live, actually, uh, with one in tow. And the story says that the, the, the boat at the back uh, was toppled by the monster. But then again, that is exactly the time when sea monsters were, along the Norwegian coast at least, were regarded as the most natural thing in the world. Stories about sea serpents go back to antiquity, so that's nothing new. I mean, they've always been around. If you look at medieval maps and so on, these maps are totally littered with sea serpents, sea monsters of various kinds. Norway is actually a very important country when it comes to sea serpents, because it's one of the first places where, where uh, sea serpents were actually described in a way which we might call scientifically. The 1970s was definitely a time when there were more sightings. That, that was a sort of transition in a sense, because before the 70s, few people had, locally at least, talked about it, or anywhere, had really talked about it. But from then on, it became a kind of national possession, you know? I mean, it's it sort of the, the nation, uh, the country as a whole, began to, uh, got to know about it, and it became a sort of well-known phenomenon. And from then on, I think, again, that the local people who have seen things have been more willing to come forward and talk about it. In the Selyard region, stories of the monster are passed down from generation to generation. My great-grandmother uh, was on the beach and she uh, washed her clothes. And then uh, the serpent came up and of course, she, get, uh, she was angry, no, she was afraid, but also maybe more angry. She kicks it with her uh, washboard. And um, it, it was uh, separated into two parts. Many people 
see the head. I guess it was the face uh, was laying uh, at the uh, still laying at the beach, and the other part uh, went out again. Stig Ellingsen is preparing to return to the waters where some unexplained force managed to raise his 440-pound boat. This is the first time he's dared to make the trip. So this is a full scale of, uh, of the lake. Uh, we are about here now. And we went here, upside follow this one on the lake and come over here and about here I think it was uh, happening for us. The lake is so mysterious. It's uh, dark and deep. It's a mysterious landscape too. It's very nice to be here. See this part. It's, uh, you know, in the summer when uh, the mostly people of, uh, see something out there. As you can see now, you will see something on the water that it's also something that looks like, for some people, sea, uh, sea serpents. Yeah, it was a bird. You can see the waves now. They're quite interesting because it's no waves on the other side, but here you see the waves. And they can also look like serpents. The lake's reputation rests on more than just its monster. In the summer, people come from all over Norway to fish for trout and perch. But on this autumn morning, it's a different kind of catch that interests Stig and his crew. They are about to arrive at the place where Stig had his remarkable encounter. It was uh, like this the day when we uh, was trying with the boat. It's like all like this. I have never been uh, bathing in Silver Lake afterwards. No? No. And I will not bath there either. Over here? Somewhere? Yeah, uh, right ahead uh, for this, uh, you know this uh, parking place on the top. You see the signs? Right outside these uh, this, uh, cabins, we were lifted up two times, and the people who see this was on the top of the road uh, where you can see the signs. So they stood up and uh, saw what happened outside. Yeah. And that's also a famous place for seeing the serpents, because uh, it's a nice view there, and people standing there, and then they sometimes see it. We didn't believe that it was a sea monster, you know? We don't think about the sea monster when you drive here. But afterwards, when you have uh, driving to it, you think about it. The average depth of the lake is only 50 meters or 165 feet, but in some places it is much deeper. So there is plenty of room to hide a giant monster. This is uh, the deepest uh, place in the cellar lake. And uh, if you can see the mountains, it is very high here, and uh, it's falling down to the lake, so it's it's about 110 meters, yeah. 150 meters. 50, yeah. And uh, in older days, they used river for transporting timber, and that's also one of the explanations uh, for some, uh, maybe some of the trees uh, were uh, ending up in the bottom, and they were rotten, and they're giving away gas, and uh, when bubbles comes up, uh, there can be a silence, uh, no waves, and but suddenly one of the bubbles from the uh, old trees can uh, make waves. Uh, it's uh, it's at power. We feel the power in uh, when you get lifted up. It was not on a uh, timber, and because if it hadn't been timber, we had driven into the propel and everything. But it, uh, it was not that. As I say, I have no explanation about why that happened, but. Uh, and it's happened two times, then it's uh, also scary. It was like, you know, slippery. Yeah. It was like soft. Yeah. And, uh, and then you, if you have uh, held a snake, yeah. yeah, you feel the power in it. It was like that when it, uh, it was very strange feeling. 
the first uh, and the second time it was like uh, I feel uh, I, I see the a television of the, the whales from uh, the north of Norway. Yeah. It was like uh, this. You see it uh, and you feel it. It was. Uh, very strange feeling. That's not the expl explanation I've heard before, that it's a whale. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a whale. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that was a new one. <laughs> In the corner here, uh, nearby the mountain, there's um, the place where my great-grandmother uh, washed her clothes with this uh, washing uh, board. Uh, sitting into the water and uh, cleaning uh, like they did in older days and then the sea serpent came up. That's the first story I've heard about uh, the sea serpent. It would be great if you had seen something, but uh, I think it's too cold. It's in the summer, yeah, it's uh, the most uh, mostly of the observation. So, but it was very nice for me to get out again and look at the part or the point where we. It's uh, you know, it's a lot of years since I've been there. I will still eat my breakfast, washing out the view uh, and cross fingers, hope I see it someday. This is uh, a part of our history and a part of our living that we have this sea serpent. That's uh, what Celeris is known for and uh, it's very nice to have something like this. Although he's covered many stories about the Celliard monster, journalist Oystein Oygarden remains skeptical. And despite the local enthusiasm for the legend, it's estimated a majority of residents share in his doubt. I must admit I haven't seen a photo that convinced me that there is a sea serpent. Most of the people in Celliard haven't seen the sea serpent and uh, if you would ask them yes or no, is there a sea serpent, yes or no, I think most would say no. Stig's best friend, the witness who believes he saw the monster, is also skeptical. I've heard the saga of the sea serpent since I was a little girl. I don't believe in it. <laughs> I'm one of the disbelievers, yeah. There's no uh, logical reason that there should be a sea serpent in Selur. I haven't got a clue. I mean, I, I realize that the, 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 the chance that there is any kind of big animal of that size in such a small lake is minimal. It's much more obvious to look for another solution, another answer to the question, but what that might be is, is totally impossible for me to say. Even if you're seduced by the legend of the Selyard monster, scientists maintain that no satisfactory evidence has been produced to verify its existence. Most of my work is with freshwater biology, freshwater ecology. I've seen big eels underwater. I met mink underwater, which gives you a scare when they come full speed towards you. Nothing that would really, really surprise a scientist. <laughs> it's a striking feature of all these lake monsters that they never caught. They're very rarely seen. And if they are seen, they <laughs> They're not clearly seen, they're not well documented. It's not big enough, it doesn't have enough uh, food, it's... Uh, uh, no one has ever seen a sea serpent. From an energetic point of view, animals like this could not possibly exist. There's not, just not the food base. I mean, obviously, if there is a monster there, there must be several, because they have to reproduce. And that's, again, where scientists would argue that the, this lake is like a bathtub, really. I mean, it's way too small for anything that size. You know, a family of those would need something far bigger. They're big creatures. They live in very restricted habitats, relatively small lakes. And it would be more than extraordinary if you had such animals living in these lakes and you would never seen them properly or you never found them. Another thing is that during the last glaciations, all these lakes, and this one too, was frozen solid 
for thousands and thousands of years, there's no way any creature could survive that. The ice melted here about 10,000 years ago, uh, and certainly it could not have developed within that very short, from a geological and, and biological point of view, very short evolutionary time span. There's a great variety of different observations. Some of them have seen just big waves, others have seen something, I suppose some of the most interesting observations are the ones with something literally sticking out of the lake, something coming up like a head, that's what many people have seen. It's depicted with a horse head sometimes, or a horse-like head, and that could easily be mistaken for a um, moose, which is very common in this area, and I've seen it many times, swimming moose in lakes, and that could be mistaken as the head of a sea serpent because usually you just see the head quite raised above the surface. I believe that the ones who think, who think they've seen a sea serpent uh, believes what they've seen, but I don't believe that, they, uh, that they're right. <laughs> Simple as that. The easiest solution is simply to say that you imagine things, you create in your mind an image of what it might be. You believe in something that you've heard before. That kind of could happen also in the Seljordsvatten or with the sea serpent here in Seljord. That the old stories have just glued to your mind. You interpret whatever you see in the context. You interpret the things you see based on your previous knowledge about these things. And there's also wishful thinking. So. There's a number of different reasons why people could believe they've seen something like this. Is the creature in Lake Selyard more myth than monster? Some residents still prefer to believe in the supernatural aspect of their lake. Professor Peter Fjagesund embodies this paradox. Although he is tempted to bow to the relentless arguments of science, he still believes he witnessed something supernatural. My father-in-law was driving, I was sitting next to him, and I had the lake on the right. And I kept seeing these waves, which looked a bit odd, because they were going in sort of odd directions that didn't quite fit in with a boat that had been sailing on the lake or, or going on the lake. So, um, and then we again came out of a bend and saw this thing far out, uh, 400 meters perhaps but we could see waves being produced, you know, pretty violently. Uh, and that went on for a while and the, the waves came into the shores. So there was no doubt that something was happening out there. And then again, it just slid under the surface and, and we never saw it again. So nobody really knows anything about what's down there. The monster of Lake Selyard is a seasonal phenomenon, mostly manifesting in the summer. It must be said that, in Norway, seasons greatly affect the population, and who knows, maybe the monsters. The summer days in this northern country are very long, and winter, well, winter is a veritable dark age. In summertime here, you, you have daylight all night. Not like, the sun is not up here. It's, it's not the midnight sun, but, but it hardly goes down just for a couple, three hours, and then it will get light again. So summer is uh, um, when we live, and winter we go to sleep. <laughs> it affects you in a sense, because you go to work when it's dark. Uh, you're inside most of the day, and when you leave from work, it's dark again. So it's basically dark for a few months, you know. You used the, the summer and the, and the autumn to collect, you know, everything, food, berries, hunting, everything, and you, you fill up your uh, store, and then winter comes, and then you concentrate on just living and, and uh, surviving the winter. And once the summer comes, Selyard residents keep hope that the monster they've been hearing about since childhood will make an appearance. 
Well, uh, when you're born here, it's hard not to hear, hear about it uh, early. Uh, so um, you hear about the uh, sea serpent uh, before you start uh, start at school. Um, it's part of our culture and history. For as long as I can remember, I've heard stories about it because these stories have circulated for, for years and years. So um, I didn't grow up exactly next to the lake where I've been living for the last 20 years, but I, I um, spent my summers uh, at a lake just across the mountains from there, and I, I knew about this from childhood. You, you drive past this lake and you know there is something here. There is this unknown thing down there. Uh, and that, I think, touches everyone in a way which, which gives the whole place a kind of dimension. People came after the 70s, during the 70s and afterwards, people actually came from various places, even from abroad, to actually look for it, you know, the way it's happened in Loch Ness as well. And I think that's a big plus for the whole place. If you live in Salernes and say that you have seen this monster, they look at you and uh, are you an idiot? <laughs> they don't want to talk about it. But in the last few years, uh, people have been more open-minded about it and uh, tell about it and uh, show pictures and films and like this. Stig is a sensible guy, a smart one. And he uh, has an experience with a sea serpent in Seljord. Uh, and I think he believes strongly. <laughs> uh, and I respect him for that. And Stig is no longer afraid to tell his story or express his opinions, even with his skeptical friends. She doesn't believe me, so... <laughs> and, uh, I'm a person who... Uh, I hope when I tell something, it's uh, for the other part to believe or not to believe what I tell, but I want to be a trustful person. I have to speak more with her so I can tell her about this is true. You want to convince me? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, convince you all the time. <laughs> I still don't believe in the sea serpent because I believe what you experienced must have come from a natural place. And uh, that natural explanation is that we were lifted up. But uh, I don't know what it is, but it's, I think it's an eel alive because you feel when something is alive. Yeah, but I agree that it has to be something in the water. Mm. Uh, but I think that all the old stories that have been told since we were little and for centuries about mm. the sea serpent, it kind of uh, infects your brain or, or makes you... Yeah. It sounds like a disease, but it's not more yeah. meaning. But thank you but very much. <laughs> a disease? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> but because you have heard the stories, you automatically think that oh, this must be the serpent. You have a name for what it is. Yeah. So it, you believe that it's a serpent instead of uh, investigating other other alternatives. Yeah. But uh, the time when this happened. I didn't believe in a sea serpent or anything. I have heard the stories also. Uh, I, I, I agree that there has to be something in the cellular Latin mm -hmm. because of all the sightseeing and all the pictures and all the strange phenomena. Mm. I, I think there's something there. Mm. There has to be something there. But I, it, whether it's the water is behaving strangely because of currents in the water mm. or if it's uh, other creatures or, or there has to be something natural. Mm. But of course, there's something in the water. Everybody, many people have seen it. Mm. But that doesn't make it a serpent. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. It must, it can't be 200 years old. It has to have kids and it has to be a family. Yeah. It, I don't think it's, it's not big enough space for a big creatures or several big creatures here. I haven't seen it and I haven't felt it. Uh, but I do believe that the people who have seen it believes themselves that, the, that they've seen it. I'm the person who has a difficulty believing in anything unless I touch it and I can feel it and can see it. I, I don't have any hope that she will uh, believe in it, but uh, I think if she experienced by, their, by herself, mm. okay, then you uh, come back and say, yes, I believe in it now.
Whether it is myth or monster, the residents of Salyard all agree that the legend of the lake monster has had a positive impact on the area. In 1989, even the city's coat of arms was modified to honor the creature. A logo, municipality logo, the sea serpent. So we are a bit proud of it, yes. And some people say that uh, this is something uh, the people here has, they have invented it for the tourism, but no. Not, 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 not like Loch Ness. They have been very good. We have not, because we are modest people, and no big tourist machine at all. I think most people in Seljord are proud of the myth about the sea serpent, but I, I, and not all the people believe in it. But uh, the myth they are proud of because it has uh, made Seljord known uh, all over the country and uh, abroad as well. Seljord uh, uh, now in Nor within Norway is, is well known for being the place which has a lake monster, right? And you might, sort of, some people might sort of feel a bit ashamed about that and sort of feel that it's sort of a bit embarrassing. Uh, but I think uh, lots of people think the opposite. It's something to be proud of. Whenever I meet people from other parts of Norway, the, the, their first question is usually, you know, have you seen the monster? Sometimes I go to other towns and speak to people and uh, I, where are you from? They ask me, I say, I'm from Sellur. Ah, have you seen the monster? And uh, no, I haven't. And then they, they laugh about it and make, make jokes about it. And I usually reply that, how many other towns of 2,000 people do you know the name? I think it's attractive to talk about the sea serpent because it's folklore and it's a myth and it's exciting. It's the same thing as the trolls or uh, any supernatural phenomena. Uh, it's exciting, really. Besides, Seljord has more than one monster legend to offer visitors. It is a city known for its gnomes, a popular legend in Norway that amuses tourists. The gnome in Norwegian, uh, a gnome is called Tusse. And it was, they are small, living under the surface of the earth. And the, uh, in the old days, uh, most people, I think, believed in the gnomes here in Norway. Here is a spot where there's no grass. There the gnome went down. At least that's what the saying is. The mystery of the Selyard monster is always on the minds of locals who share stories and exchange theories. Stig Ellingsen admits to being stunned and hopes one day to understand what happened to him that fateful summer day on Lake Selyard. I don't know what happened that day. I'm not uh, sure. We didn't see anything, but we was lifted up two times and that was enough for me <laughs> to think that is uh, something big down there. An un unknown animal that is in the lake. That's the only explanation I can find. This monster to me is sort of this fantastic phenomenon of something that we can't explain, you know? And I, I like it that way. I, in a sense, I very much hope that it will never be explained properly. Because as long as it retains its, its secrecy, um, its mystery, uh, there's something to sort of ponder about and think about for everyone. I think it's a good story, but from a biological point of view, it's not possible. From a scientist's point of view, if you really found a creature like this existing in a small, relatively small like this, it would be like a sensation, it, <laughs> a Nobel Prize. It would, it would be the most fantastic thing you could ever discover. I have never seen something that I think, wow, that's the sea monster, that's the sea serpent. So uh, I'm still uh, looking for that. <laughs> and you know, it's uh, nice to have the mystery of uh, that we have a sea serpent in the lake. And you know, of course we wish all people to come and look for it, because it's uh, really great to be here and look for it. And maybe you can see it sometime. It's a good, I think it's a good place for a monster, really. Yeah. <laughs>